So did you ever wonder what really spooks a serial killer's descendant? pair of peeps and welcome to this edition of our haunted travels i'm your host marianne donnelly i'm alone today uh but that's all right i'm going to be talking to you a little bit about jeff mudgett's speech in the toledo midwest parafest conference uh, that was held just this past weekend in toledo ohio this is going to be part two of the series so if you haven't checked out the first one make sure that you do that we'll put a little link to that about here but before I go ahead and turn it over to Jeff, I'm just going to remind you that if you are into the paranormal, if you're into history or forensic sciences, make sure that you hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to ding the little bell so that you'll hear from us next time we post a new video here at Panic D Videos. So what are we going to talk about in this section? Well, you're going to hear from Jeff about what he finds spooky. And also, what did they find when they dug up his alleged great-great-grandfather's grave? You'll also hear a little bit about what he uh, had as answers to some questions from audience members. And even a little bit maybe about the silver screen and the future for his book, Bloodstains. Without further ado, let's go see Jeff. As they're digging and as the skull comes up, the archdiocese from Philadelphia comes up to me and makes sure he's not on film. And he whispers in my ear, he goes, my son, are you sure you know what it is you release here today? That would be my head. And that was spooky. That was spooky. I'm thinking about, you know, let's just go get a steak sandwich. <laughs> 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 I've had enough. I've had enough. But, you know, it's, it's a moment of my family's history. I can say that. So the scientists do their work. They get the bones out. Um, they take them back to the UPenn amazing laboratory. You, if you ever get a chance to go to the UPenn in the lab there, Hey, Jeff, let me know about time. I don't know what we're doing. Uh, it'll hold up uh, like 15 minutes to minutes. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go over it anyway. <laughs> but um, if you ever get to go to the UPenn lab, you walk through this museum of artifacts from the Sphinx, from the pyramids, from King Henry II. I mean, amazing stuff that you're just, I was shocked that they had possession of this incredible stuff. And uh, they have Holmes' computer across there now. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the judge gave them permission to keep that. He, it, everything was supposed to go back the way it was when we we it. So the, the bones went to the, the lab. They were cleaned up. I, I hope a lot of you have seen on the Bloodstains Facebook page the skull, the actual skull after it had been cleaned by the, the, uh, the technicians, it's perfectly preserved. And uh, I snuck in before the film crews. And the technicians knew I was getting in the back door of the lab. And I, and I held the skull in my hand and asked him. Uh, it was a rat. It was a rat. So when I walked in the lab that day, I was shocked to see how short the skeleton was. It looked more like something from an African rainforest, like an orangutan or something. It was strange, it looked very strange. So I grabbed Amarillo before the film crews got in and I said, Man, look at this, look at this, look at this thing. And she by that time, she realized that the tension between me and the production crew and the director was intense. We almost argued every day. It was, it was rough. Which I'm, I found later on, that's pretty common in television shows, co-hosts and production teams. You have no say in the 
content or say whatsoever. So I told her, I said, come, come look at this. This is very strange. I even punched her on the arm a little bit. And uh, she just went closed out. She wouldn't talk about it. Storm down. So at that point, I started thinking, you know, this, this theory about him having escaped the execution and substituted another in his place, this is, this is got evidence behind it now. We've got to start doing a little harder dig on this. And I immediately, my father and I gave a DNA sample so that we could match each up because we're talking about, I don't know how many of you, how many of you watch any television shows about DNA? I mean, it's, it's all over television now, right? So we're talking about my me, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, Holmes. That's called the direct paternal line. <laughs> the Y chromosomes. They don't change. They're exact. They don't lie either. Well, the judge ordered a sample take. So I was there when the King's College of London, the foremost laboratory in the world, got on the phone and instructed the uh, technicians there and the two anthropologists how to take the exact sample they want, the exact one they want, and they turn the skull over and they, with a diamond drill bit, there's a pocket in the back of your skull which is porous. And they have them drill into this porous pocket. They take that sample, I saw them package it priority and mail it out. It was May, May. And the King's College, and you can tell, except for me, everyone in the room there had already made up their mind that it was homeless. They had a bias and a preconceived notion that my theory was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> and that it was homeless, this was had been a waste of money, and they were going to try to run this show to get the ratings they possibly could. Well, they spent all summer long unable to get a match. On a test that takes three days. The scientists at UN told me they'd been working with King's College all summer. Couldn't get enough. They had decided that the reason they weren't getting a number, because they'd already decided it was homeless, was that the remains had degraded to a point. And you can see the scientists' comments to the Associated Press about this. They degraded to a point where DNA was useless. Well, you know, I, I was never an expert at DNA, but I remember National Geographic doing television shows about them taking DNA from the pharaohs and the pyramid. We're talking about a guy with two generations separating my father. So the tension grew and grew and grew, and history was on the production company to get that final episode out. <laughs> So that last show that you watched, I watched with you, I, I hadn't seen it. I hadn't seen it before, I didn't get to sign off on it. And that last conclusion was that the dental records and DNA testing conclusively links a match with Jeff Martin, proving that what we exhumed was H.H. H. Holmes. Well, I immediately got on the phone and I called the UN scientist and I said, uh, Janet, what, what's that about? She was, I don't know. I was just as shocked as you would see it. So I called NBC News, which the next day had come out with a headline in Philadelphia about and, uh, DNA proves Holmes was in the grid match. And uh, I told NBC News, where'd you get that? Where'd you get those numbers? Well, uh, we were watching the show. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you guys can't do that. I said, I want you to research those, that 
headline you had there and then get back to me. Well, NBC News for track on the fifth page of some newspaper, not a headline. So, history would have talked to me about it. But then about two weeks after the show ended, we had a partial profile come from King's College. Partial profile is all oh, six or seven numbers that match up with a DNA comparison. So I called my friend who's an expert at the University of Berkeley in forensic science, and he said, no, you can't have a partial profile on a, on a direct paternal line. It's either matches or it doesn't match. It doesn't lie. That's it. So what we're doing now is we're going to the judge who allowed the exhumation, who made a final order that the exhumation had resulted in the identification of the remains as H.H. Holmes because of the DNA. We put a program together to go back to the judge to force him to reopen the case and to state that the DNA didn't prove a match with me. And that if the DNA isn't a match, and this is, this is the tough. You've got two possibilities. It's either H.H. H. Holmes or it isn't, or and my family's not thrilled about this. Someone in the line, my grandmother, my great grandmother, Holmes' wife, was unfaithful. But the DNA labs can establish that fact with some extra research. We can also, which I don't know if my family would agree with, we can send they can send a drill down into the the, the, the grave of my grandfather and my great grandfather and take a sample. So we're, we're doing that right now, hoping that the History Channel will reopen that final episode. Because to me, that's an amazing part of American history. And obviously, I'm the one most interested in it in the entire world. But if he come Moya Mansing Prison and the whole jurisprudence system, if he escaped prison, execution, and if he substituted another in his place, we have, we have perhaps the most fascinating story, I think, in American history. And we're on that. So what we did the other day was, and I think, I, do I got enough time to hit another issue? Okay. What they came back to me with was, okay, Jeff, okay, Jeff, the DNA's not working, but we've got dental records proving the remains for H.H. H. Holmes. I tried to tell them that the dentist that examined him in the grave was his knew him from Chicago. And anybody that knew Holmes, that worked with Holmes, was thinking out of the box that there was a reason for his connection that didn't work. So the U Penn gave me my in, which will be another part of the new television show. The U Penn, when they were inspecting the skull, comparing the teeth of the skull to the dental records the examination that was done of Holmes' teeth in prison. Holmes. They found gold foil fillings on the teeth from the remains. The so-called Holmes dental records never mentioned any fillings or gold. All they did was describe dental casts impressions made from someone's teeth, who we don't know when, where, by whom, or of whom they were made. 
That's exactly the ammo that Holmes used the fake life insurance companies of, of from, for fraud. So, if we can establish that the dental records don't apply, if we can establish that the DNA wasn't a match, we have the new pen scientists stating, I'll have them on tape, the DNA wasn't a match. We also have them admitting that the skeleton was too short by at least six inches. <coughs> Forensic science will give anthropologists measuring the remains, skeletal remains, two inches. They'll give them that because of the ligaments and tissue that dissolve under skeleton. They don't give them six inches. When we take the fact that the UPenn scientists have admitted that there was no trauma to the neck, despite the doctors at the prison discussing the axis and atlas vertebra being separated by the fall through the scaffold, how they had to remove the, the fall was so violent, the noose was embedded in the flesh of his neck. The doctors had to remove the rope after the fall with a knife. Obviously, his ability to con an entire prison system of a hanging and execution is, is a difficult exercise to consider. It would have taken the greatest con that ever struck the structure. But when you have the DNA not matching, when you have the skeleton too short, when the dental records don't apply, and when there's no trauma to the neck from a hanging. It's time for us to start looking at the possibility that maybe, just maybe, he pulled it off. And, and that's what I'm working on now, trying to get history to go back into that final episode. They already own all the footage. They already own all the evidence. It'd be very cheap for them to do. But they can step forward and discuss the truth with the American people. I'd love to take any questions you have about anything you've got for me. I love, I love taking questions for the audience. I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but, um, okay, let's say that he did escape his execution. Right. You know, if you look into the possibility of, uh, you know, leopard doesn't change his spots, and you look into the possibility that he continued his, that he found somebody that continued that murder, that, that, that way of life. Pro, yeah, you know, there might have been, I mean, probably would have been somewhere else, but. Anyone that was involved in his arrest, his incarceration, the trial, which was most, one of the most elaborate trials in the history of American law, he fired his lawyers and defended himself. He cross-examined one of his wives, who the judge allowed to testify because he was she wasn't his legal wife. He had too many. Um, anyone involved in that trial that it irritated, anyone involved at the prison that it irritated, after the so-called burial, either suffered death or terrible misfortune. To me, that's while not direct evidence that would stand up in a trial in a criminal. Court. And this was after it's his certain look at after, after, after the judge. I write about it in the book. Now, the, the chapter I write about in the book about Holmes visiting the judge is me making up what could have happened. Okay? That's fiction based on a true story. And I want you all to understand that's what my book is. Because there's gaps in there that I put together based on what I think could have happened. A lot of authors don't do that these days. They do those gaps and then they tell you they've written nonfiction, and I, I don't agree with that. But it's a great question. But I think he had a blank check to go do whatever he wanted. Right. Whatever he wanted. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. After watching all the shows and reading the book, the poster book, and you know, talking to other people I know about it, yeah, there's a lot of people that believe there were Holmes style killings even years after you know the whole thing was over. 
One of the uh, most amazing parts of American River was the, the portions we did in London and then coming back across. And you know, the, the crew was already doubtful of my theory that Holmes had written Dear Boss and murdered Catherine Eddowes. History and I had had considerable arguments about they wanted the show to be about me saying Holmes killed all five, all right? I told them I don't have evidence of all five. I have evidence of Catherine Eddowes, number three of the five. I even had Scotland Yard investigators come up to us, to us while we were shooting in London and tell them they agreed with my theory that there were two copycats involved and that history had for 100 years been dead wrong. All right? So, wait, one second. Right. So, when Amaryllis jumped into the fray, when we first started the show, she came up to me, we were at a bar having a drink, and she came up to me and said, you know, mind you, your theory is the best. I'm, I'm here to make a TV show and set my career on fire. And I hope the yes is okay. So. And um, so when she, they put her to work studying the passenger lists from the ships that were coming back and forth at the time of the Catherine Eddowes and the Deer Boss riding, she found, if you remember on the show, she found two or three Holmes aliases with signatures that were remarkably similar. She still wasn't convinced, but she was evolving. When we got back to Chicago, she went to work with a, a detective, retired detective named Ray Johnson, who's a brilliant man. They went down to the archives. During the World's Fair, there was over 20 million people that visited Chicago from around the world. And over 500 women went missing. The cops were just overloaded. They couldn't handle the, the work off. Well, there were three or four suicides on the lake during the fair when Holmes was running the murder castle that had, the cops called them suicides, the police. They had slit neck and disemboweled stomach. Right in Chicago, when Holmes was there. At the end of the show, Amarillo's came up to me and she said, I believe, I believe, I, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. So, great question, Jack. Excuse my stupidity. Okay. No, I love questions. Now, you're talking about the river, Jack the River. Yeah. I can't remember exactly, was, was it the river before uh -huh. this or after? See, I can't remember. It's a great question because uh, one of the UPenn scientists, when I was having my maximum frustration with the whole uh, procedure, said that Jeff's theory was that Holmes had escaped execution. There had been another buried in his place and then he'd gone to London to commit the Jack the River murder <laughs> on national television. He was executed, in, supposedly executed in 1896. The Ripper killings were 1888, and you know that went out on the national television. But no, it was before. It was way before. He built the murder castle in 91, 92. I'm so you were actually talking about the Chicago River in one of those places that Holmes got rid of. So yeah. Have we been able to get there? Uh, I'll tell you, great, great. Little uh, side story to that. Uh, I was told we found in the river with the ground uh, with the radar and um, the, ma the machinery. I forget the name exactly, but they used to get down into the mud of the river to find objects. Uh, we found two coffin-shaped objects in the river. The procedure to have gotten permission to have dug in the river through the silt, through the muck, and grabbed those objects up to see what they actually were, we would have taken the EPA, the Federal Waterways Commission, the state of Illinois, the mayor's office, the sheriff's department, everyone would have had to have signed off on it and then set their own parameters for us to do it. 
uh, I don't blame history at all for that. But what I do blame them for is telling me that they didn't, they asked and they didn't get permission. I was at a cocktail party in Chicago about oh, six months after the shooting ended and the, uh, Rob, Rob Emanuel, the mayor of Emanuel's assistant came up to me and he goes, Jesus, much of it. I love that show you guys had on. The best part was the Chicago River. Why didn't you dig those things up? And I said, well, we asked you, the mayor, and he goes, no, you didn't. Right. He said, we would have said yes. He said, the mayor was watching every episode. So, you know, it's, it's a tough, the TV world's tough. It's expensive, they have budgets, and, uh, you know, do the best you can. I got a new cover. I love the questions. That many tough ones, did you? Tell us more about the the Caprio series. If you know anything about yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, the uh, Aramount bought six copies of my book. All right, folks, so you're going to notice that there's going to be a little bit of a change in the quality of the video coming up right after this. And that's because, well, the camera died. The battery power was um, taken away. Now, was it because the, it was an hour? I don't think so. It should be able to last longer than that. But we were in a haunted building. In any case, we went ahead and uh, started shooting with my uh, cell phone, so it's a little bit of a switch up. So, just in case you notice. Leonardo DiCaprio told um, Rolling Stone that this was the role he looked forward to his whole career to play Holmes. Martin Scorsese, the great director, was going to put it together. And they thought they'd arranged $200 million to produce this epic movie about Holmes, the murder castle, and, and the World's Fair in Chicago. Well, about, I don't know if you remember, but about <laughs> three, four months ago, they both backed out of it and gave it to Paramount Television, which is now making a series on Hulu, Death in the White City. And they've been talking to my agent about us helping them with that series because they realize <clears throat> there's not enough in the book Devil in the White City to do a two or three season series. And um, they love the part about the murder, the Holmes curse, you know, and visiting those people. Out. So there's going to be a series on Hulu. We don't know who the actor is going to play Holmes. But it's not a which I'm disappointed. And then, like I said, we've got you know an outfit that wants to do it. the Scorsese talked to the press about the difficulties they were having with Devil in the White City. It was a movie, and I know you all realize this: a movie needs a pro and a con. You can't walk out of the movie thinking this man is a hero. It didn't, they just they can't do that with history or anything. And the difficulty they were having was, who's the pro in this movie? All we have is an evil man who murders innocent women and men who, who misrupt his contracts. Well, the, the people that contacted me like the fact that this story has a pro and a con. It's got an uh, innocent who finds out his past and then struggles to escape doing the same thing, following the family line. Which is, you know, that's the modern horror stories now. Insidious, uh, The Conjuring, those James Wan movies, you know, that make a fortune. They make them, they were, I, I've been getting filled in on this. They make them for five or six million dollars, these horror movies, and they make 90 million dollars. You know? So they, Hollywood loves modern horror. And then all they do is a few recreations of going back and doing the murder castle and things like that. So that's, that's what they're looking at now. But from what I understand, Paramount is producing the series right now of H.H. H. Holmes in, at, the, at the World's Fair. So. Yeah. Okay, so we have two graves. 
kind of side by side. Yeah. And the first one, AP delta, is an intact often. Empty. Empty. And the other one is a concrete. Two feet lower. And, and what's, what is it? It's like a box. There was a box lid. We couldn't tell if the rest of the wood had decomposed or not, but there was a box lid. And on the top of the lid, it said AJ Holmes Stash Herman Mudge. <coughs> so, um, you know, the, when the film crews and the UPN saw that, they were done. They were done. That's, that's Holmes. That's Herman Mudge. The name's on the box. Right. This guy's been, he was kind of, I always found it amazing. They wanted to use the dental records of a cast, an impression taken of an inmate's teeth from a man who would have had to have consented to do that, who refused an autopsy after the death. Then they explained off the skeletal differences, stating that Holmes must have worn lifts in his boots. These are scientists. When they took the boots off the skeleton, there were no lips. Plus, the doctor states in his examination, he even mentions the size of Holmes' and sexual organs. Well, it seems like a naked man that you notice had lifts in his boots before you measured how tall he was, to me. So, you, the, the grave is a fascinating story in that why would Holmes have bought two plots? Why would he put a fake? Now the, now, the scientists all say that was his way of just getting people to leave him alone. They saw the fake, they gave up. We almost did. We almost did. So it was, uh, it was, it's a fascinating story. He's, he, he made thousands and thousands of dollars while he was in prison writing memoirs and giving confessions, which were all lies to the Philadelphia Inquirer about how many he murdered, the things he did, all those things. Um, pathological liar, uh, anything you read. I was telling my two friends that uh, one of the uh, great books to read is Holmes' memoirs. He's a fabulous writer. Now you may have noticed he looked right at us. I actually was talking to Jeff about this earlier, so I'm wondering, were we the two friends? An incredible storyteller. Um, maybe the greatest of crime that's ever lived. And it's sitting in the Library of Congress. Um, but you've got to go in there knowing that everything you read in that book is a lie. Okay? The interesting part, I, the thing that I found most fascinating was when he ran, he married my great great grandmother, Clara, when they had their boy, Robert, my great grandfather. Holmes was an incredible student, um, brilliant. But when other boys were out hunting and fishing, he was working with a, uh, I don't know, his name is Dave. What's, what's the guy's name that works with cadavers? Where he was working in Martin when he was 13, dealing with bodies. I mean, and, yeah, yeah. And they were fine. They were normal. And then before he went off to University of Michigan, Ann Arbor to uh, have his medical degree at Il, Il Martin in New Hampshire, he taught elementary school. Oh. School still there. Church still there. House is still there. I've been in his bedroom. Interesting stuff. Is the house still in the family? No. Now the family moved west to get away from the stigma. And during the time that the papers were writing that this was the devil, this was Satan in clothes, okay, in the flesh. And the family moved to California to get away from it all. This was the O.J. Simpson trial at the time. Every newspaper was there. The, the, one of the great uh, captions, when the jury came back, announced their finding of guilt, they had Holmes chained up to lead off. The women, six women in the audience 
of the trial stood up and they were crying as he was being let off. And the newspapers at the time covered those crocodile tears from those women who knew then what he was, who he was, and how he treated them, lied to them, but they were still, he was quite a charmer. He was quite maybe one of a kind as far as dealing with those things. I mean, the back and forth of his cross-examination of his one wife was maybe, they still teach it in moot court at law school. He'd never gone to law school. He'd never practiced law. We've only got a few more minutes left. You've got some great questions. I'm having a lot of fun. So if you've got some about working with uh, history. Uh, well, you inherited his charm. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will tell you this. Not his hair. I will tell you this. The nine months we were in the production for American River, they treated me like a king. I mean, it is, you get very used to them carrying your bags in airports and stuff. I got very used to that when it stopped. I'm carrying my bag. But the, the food they fed us, the places we stayed, it was, it, was, it was amazing. It was a lot of fun. Well, thank you very much. You've been a great night. Para peeps, there you have it. A little bit of uh, Jeff Mudgett's speech from the Midwest Parafest Conference in Toledo, Ohio this past week. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, until next time, thanks for watching and happy hunting. Let us know if you like this video by hitting that thumbs up. Also, if you'd like to see more videos from us in the future, support our channel by hitting that subscribe button and dinging that bell so you get notified the next time there's a video from Panic D Videos. Thanks for watching. Happy hunting. <laughs>